All right. Hey, welcome back, listener. This is Josh J.C. Felto for The Writer's Lens. And today I have a very special guest here on the podcast. Uh, his name is Sam Eldridge. Uh, if you don't know who Sam is, he is the co-author of Killing Lions, A Guide Through the Trials That Young Men Face. And if you're viewing this via video, then you're going to see that I have brought the book with me as well. So, Sam, there you go, man. Good stuff. We'll we'll, we'll dig into that later. So, <laughs> oh, thank you for that, Josh. I'm terrible at self promotion. So uh, <laughs> no right. Most writers are not that great at self promotion. We're a little bashful, which is funny, right? It yeah. doesn't make sense with like the creative part, but you know. Yeah, it doesn't. We'll, we'll we'll kind of unpack that a little bit if we want a little bit later. So, uh, Sam is uh, you're presently in Colorado Springs, Colorado, correct? So all the way mm-hmm. over in the beautiful state of Colorado, uh, where he works on film projects, other writing endeavors, and and Sons Magazine as well. Uh, so we'll unpack that as well. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And in his spare time, he enjoys cigars, Casamigos, and films by Hayao Miyazaki. Did I get that correct? That's pretty good. Yeah. That's pre- that was pretty good. Okay, yeah, I'm I'm semi familiar with his work. So when I was reading that about your bio, I said, "Man, Sam and I are semi kindred spirits." I think so. <laughs> so yes, <it's- laughs> right on. Uh, and then, if that weren't enough, uh, he loves riding motorcycles, sailing, cycling, and adventuring with his wife Susie. You're like the ultimate dude, man. You're, you're oh, like- <laughs> geez. You know, you take the little snapshot, and I think anybody sounds pretty cool. Yeah, so, the day to day is much less sexy than that. <laughs> It's all good. It's all good. Sam, uh, thanks so much for being here on the Writer's Lens. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, Josh, thanks for having me on. Yeah, man. Obviously, it's one of those uh, cool moments where I've read someone's work and I enjoyed it and I thought it was really good. And just being able to kind of talk to the person who was behind it is a real uh, blessing. So thank you so much again for just taking the time, man. Yeah. Oh, thank you. So... so for those who don't know Sam, other than the really cool snapshot that I just gave of mm-hmm. your life, what is your story? So I, I haven't really laid out any foundation as to, you know, the group at Ransom Heart or even, uh, you know, the boot camps and even the podcast necessarily that you and I think Blaine do together. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, what is the story of Sam Eldridge? Where is he at today? Like, where has he come from? So, so let's, Woo! let's. Oh, okay. Just that. Um. Yeah, it's, I'll give you the a short and hopefully uh, mm. colorful synopsis of that. So, grew up in Colorado, the son of John Eldridge, who wrote mm. Wild at Heart. Now, I don't know, what is that, almost 20 years ago? Probably. Um, probably. You're getting close to that anniversary. So, um, had a really interesting uh, childhood that in some ways is really idyllic. Like we're right here in the mountains, we're on the front range. So a lot of time outside loved story. This, my parents actually met in a theater company. And so that's the, the lens through which they experience life. I guess mm. just constantly telling stories. So I've got many, a, a childhood memory of my dad doing voices and reading us books at bedtime. And so we, this like was instilled in us and was the way that we understood the world was the way that we understood mm-hmm. uh, the gospel and Jesus and all of that. And so mm-hmm. um, that was amazing. But it also meant that I kind of grew up on like the a side stream of Christianity mm-hmm. um, and just sort of assumed that like people hear the voice of God and you go outside and have adventures and he meets you in these places and things you mm-hmm. love. And so um, my journey has been long and winding. And I, I don't know that I would have guessed that I would be working here essentially for my dad in his ministry. Um, though what we get to do is awesome. Mm-hmm. We get to be creative and have all these like entrepreneurial sort of uh, problems to solve where mm-hmm. we write constantly. And um, we might go on this more later, but I had to I had to work through a bunch of my own identity and, and wrestlings to get mm-hmm. to that point. It, it wasn't easy and isn't. For anybody that's worked with family, you know mm-hmm. things have to be healthy or they're unsustainable. And so I've been here for four years and it's been a blast and it's had to be healthy (laughs) when it hasn't been, we've had to work through it. (laughs) That's awesome, man. I was actually, um, a bit of a kind of an interesting moment here. I think back in 2013, it was, I actually was out at the, one of the ransom heart camps in Colorado. Mm -hmm. And for those who are listening, who don't know, Ransom Heart is this men's ministry uh, that John, Sam's father, started, uh, you said, what, 20 years ago or so? 
Yeah, Isma. getting close. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, just really speaking to the hearts of men, the souls of men, just trying to, you know, make them come alive essentially, uh, in God and uh, finding that identity in God, not in other things such as work or relationships or failures especially. And I was out there with a group of guys uh, and I was, it was just before I was getting married and you actually got to speak at that event. And, oh, awesome. Yeah, and you got to speak, so it was pretty cool. So, you know, we kind of hung around. I don't think I actually got to talk to you while I was there. But uh, but it was cool that you were you actually got out there and told a little bit of your story. But I did want my listeners to hear a little bit of your story too, because you know people might recognize as well. You know John Eldridge writing Route at Heart, and may not know that you. Hey, you've also been writing some stuff too, and you work also in the ministry, which is pretty cool. So um, so yeah, so good stuff. How yeah. is that then, as far as writing or co-writing a book like Killing Lions? I mean you know, just doing that book, or maybe you want to give me kind of the genesis of that book and like what it was, yeah. you know, what it was all about. Oh, totally. Okay. So, um, in, in some respects, I think people might misinterpret the story if they go, wow. So, um, mm-hmm. dad, phenomenally successful author mm-hmm. and this ministry that goes after like, the hearts of guys, this must've been a no brainer. Mm-hmm. It's like, well, wait, wait, actually I've had this like journey of being like, you have to do something else. Even mm-hmm. though I had this desire to write, it felt very um, like unvalid because it was so connected to what my family does. Mm-hmm. But like I mentioned earlier, like story was how I experienced the world and loved the world. It's actually what I went to get my undergrad degree in was English and storytelling and writing. And um, but I never thought I could write. Like mm-hmm. despite doing it all through college. It was sort of like this, yeah, but then it's going to stop or somehow it's invalid or, mm-hmm. I mean, you name it. I actually believe I needed to write with a pseudonym. Like if I used a pen name, somehow it would be <laughs> like, okay. I, I don't know like how this happened, but this is, this is just the story. Mm-hmm. Um, and so post college, um, thankfully I've got a really great relationship with my dad and mm-hmm. we started having these weekly conversations Mm-hmm. We jump on the phone and like, I think it was Wednesday nights because I went from, yes, I'm going to be a writer. I'm going to do these things with my life. It's going to be like super clear. And then <laughs> I think as most people experience in that transition, it's like, wait, I am, my job was running errands for a wealthy family in town. Mm. So like picking up cat food and then returning the cat food when their froofy cat didn't like half the flavors. And I'm like, you guys are, this is crazy. Like, I'm, <laughs> Surely I could do something else with my day. Right. Um, so these, I'd have these phone calls with my dad and we'd just mm-hmm. be processing like, what are dreams that are for now? What mm-hmm. are dreams that are for later? How do I become the kind of man I want to be mm-hmm. later when right now it feels so mundane? I'm just trying to keep mm-hmm. my head above water. What do I do with this girl that I'm dating? And so all of these very natural conversations that were happening for my sake then became the spark of like, whoa, this is actually a really great bit, bit of content here. Um, mm-hmm. What if we... My dad pitched me the idea. He goes, what if we wrote a book together? My immediate reaction was no. <laughs> right. Like, for, for all of those things I already named, like I don't want to uh, mm-hmm. write with my last name. I don't feel valid in that. Mm-hmm. And I had to have, it was a conversation with my uh, brother-in-law actually, who was mm-hmm. like, you don't, your, your door that's opening seems invalid because of your story. But mm-hmm. for anybody else, that'd be such like an obvious open door. Like take it. Yeah, like that opportunity is there. You'd be a fool mm-hmm. not to. And it was this like, oh, I've been, I think, living in some false bravado that I had to make my own way, reinvent the wheel. And so mm-hmm. when I shifted internally to, yeah, this is something I want to do and this would be an amazing experience, um, I ended up coming out to Colorado and for a summer co-authored a book with my dad. And it was it was an amazing experience, man. Like it was awesome. it was one of the best like four months ever where I got to just mm-hmm. learn from him and really kind of take not kind of fully take the low seat at the table. <laughs> right. <laughs> and be like, this is what you do. You're gifted at this. Teach me what you've learned. Mm. And it's going to be this dynamic writing stories and questions back and forth. And like, mm. I mean, it was that summer was a total joy. That's awesome, man. It is interesting when it comes to writing, how we feel like we have to have our own sort of almost like pride rock, you know, like, totally. we, you know, we have to have our own foundation. We have to have our own platform and all these things. And, and isn't the reality of anything that we do in life, we have to have someone that's willing to show us the door and to give mm-hmm. us like a rite of passage even, 
you know, into that space. Uh, so, you know, I, I still wrestle with this myself. I mean, I'm, I'm the only one in my family. I have five brothers. So I got, oh my gosh. <laughs> I got, I got five brothers and they run the gamut. I'm, I'm right in the middle. So, so I'm the, I'm the only one that's published anything thus far. I don't know if the other ones are ever going to publish anything, but it's strange how it's, it's like, desiring somebody that would have been in the family. I've, you know, thought about this once or twice, like that would have been like, yeah, this is what you do. This is actually mm -hmm. the process. This is, this is going to be your, you know, your launch pad for the next five or six years. And this is what it's going to look like. And having somebody really close to me that could say that, uh, it's just like, oh man, that would have been really cool to have, you know, someone. It was a ready. huge gift. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, to have that was amazing. And there is that tension of, I have my own voice. Mm -hmm. I have my own style. What like if I were, I'm dreaming of doing a solo book project and what does mm -hmm. that look like? Is it mm -hmm. all of those pieces? And mm -hmm. like, I, there is something humbling about asking for help. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And it, it may not look like kind of what you're expecting for me. Mm -hmm. I totally expected to be like, I'm going to go to some writer's conference. I'm going to like meet some sage. I'm going to do this thing. And <laughs> it was like, somebody was like, dude, like your dad, why are, why is this not obvious to you <laughs> to be obvious to anyone else? Like, oh. Good point. Yeah. Sometimes those are the hardest. That's like the hardest window to look through, man. It's just like, Oh, he's right there. Okay. That's cool. <laughs> that's that's good. Right. So as far as just that inspiration that you talked about, about, you know, this sort of story, conversations between father and, and son, I mean, is that really like the voice that you feel, especially with the and sons, if we want to transition and talk about that a little bit, is that really an area where you feel like, okay, this is where my heart is, is that I want to help other young men recognize like humility, uh, the ability to ask for something. I mean, is that where you feel like some of your, vo your voice has really emerged is in that specific area? Mm -hmm. Or do you have more like, okay, there's other things I want to do, obviously, and I'm going to do yeah. them off over here. Or is this the kind of the primary voice? I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, great question. So um, I, I would go to these events, like the one you mentioned, that these mm -hmm. events that the ministry puts on the mountains. And like they are phenomenal because mm -hmm. you watch the power of story of the larger narrative and of our own lives, the way that mm -hmm. our, our stories are unfolding. Mm -hmm. And then the ways that we get to go after men and, and meet them there. And I'm like, wait, this is amazing work. Who wouldn't want to do this? Mm -hmm. And, and yet there's, so there's a part of me that goes, yes, I can come alongside it. And there's something that I want to bring as well. So mm -hmm. that's, that's sort of like the meta answer to the question of <laughs> with Anson's, I think I first started with the, the college friends I had, I was mm -hmm. watching their lives and I, I I'm constantly looking ahead in decisions to see if it's something I want to do. Like does, is this lifestyle sustainable mm -hmm. is the guy who's been living this for 30 years a guy i want to be because if not like why would i do that exactly. now i smoke cigarettes for a super long time and it, it can be incongruous as well <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> however <laughs> i i would look at the the trajectory my peers seem to be choosing and it was like do you company up do you just kind of get by the next thing it feels really good that makes you look like you're successful and mm -hmm. looking at that going like i just there needs there seems to be more and mm -hmm. so it was part seeing a need that my friends i mean thinking about the wider world people that i could actually picture their faces and be like tyler trevor like i can i, I know who you are this is for you mm -hmm. let's go on this together because i'm not there yet so that's a lot of the tone is this mm -hmm. i don't pretend to have any more answers than the ones i have but if we're side by side or i'm one step ahead of you and a half mm -hmm. step it's like come this way we're on we're looking on this journey the other half was I, this is lessening, but there was a, I would say a decade there where the, uh, the, the hatred of millennials was really per permissible. Like it was just, that was the humor <laughs> style. That was like yep. the narrative that was going on. And like, mm -hmm. I was sick of it. Mm -hmm. Like I, every generation has done this. We have some things that are clearly just young, but we have some things that are different. Mm -hmm. How are we both innovators and mm -hmm. justice seekers mm -hmm. and also super lazy and terrible people yeah. like <laughs> right. your tip and so I, I wanted to step in that space and be like okay yes we're at a time of massive comfort and things are really easy mm -hmm. no that does not inherently make us weak mm -hmm. there are other choices we can make so like that this was all part of like this distillation of yes massive voice emerging there mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. However, in that journey, I've totally found I come alive in talking about things that I care about, which sounds mm-hmm. obvious. Like yeah. everybody does. Right. Um, but a couple of years ago, my wife and I um, experienced a miscarriage mm-hmm. and it was massively painful and mm. formational for us. Mm. And I basically sat down on my computer a week into the process and mm. just closed the office door and wept and wrote for like two hours mm. and had, had no doubt that it was to be offered to the public, that mm. this was part of my healing process, but also part of my, why would I talk about anything else? Like this is, yeah. this is where my heart is. This is where my grief is this is where my pain is if i can bring words here that will connect with other people's stories like Mm. this is amazing Mm -hmm. and so that's a place where i've really found i don't need to go like looking for grief to get ammunition or fire (laughs) or like there's plenty of that out there but i know that like my heart is particularly sensitive to those things and Mm. and willing to talk about them willing to go there and i didn't know that at first that took me a little while in the writing and public Mm. world to be oh this is something I'm comfortable with and I, I love doing. That's really awesome, man. That's great. I mean, it, just the fact that also you were growing up immersed into the power of storytelling and sort of recognizing, you know, if I share my own story with people, that mm-hmm. has impact, you know, that has influence. And I mean, as, as writers, we're always very hopeful that our words have impact. You know, I mean, that's, it almost goes without saying, but it's, yeah. It's just, you know, we, we're very hopeful that the words we have are influential and they're also impactful, positively, uh, but, the, but they're definitely impactful. As far as, um, you know, that part of it, being influenced by grief, you were saying, and using our words to kind of help other people, who are your biggest influences? I mean, who are the, you know, who are the writers, you know, who are the voices that you have sort of absorbed and you've said, mm-hmm. okay, these are people that I want to aspire to be like. Like who would, who would that be on your list? Yeah. So, um, my interests are on a wide range. Mm -hmm. Um, it used to really bug me that kind of people that would have like eight books on their nightstand that they're like all (laughs) halfway into, I've become that person. Like I shouldn't have been so judgy. (laughs) I'm the same way. (laughs) I I totally geek out with like Stephen Hawking's a brief history of time where I'm like, this is amazing. I want to do something with all of this craziness. Um, but it, it actually doesn't have to affect the way I live my life. Mm -hmm. And so it can be like this joy piece. Mm -hmm. Um, Pilgrim at Tinker Creek, um, Mm -hmm. Annie Dillard's book that she wrote about like 18, 19 and won the Pulitzer for like very unhelpful to have that as a, (laughs) a goal for yourself. And I was reading it and I'm like, I think I was 18 when I read it. Oh, wow. Okay. So I still have one more year to get a Pulitzer. Like perfect. Like I'm not done. (laughs) And then I turned 20 and I was like, dang it, I failed. <laughs> I failed at that. No, add it to the list. Add it to uh, the list. Exactly. <laughs> so I, I love I love voices that like bring you into those mm. those really intimate spaces. Mm. I love her style of like, here's the cosmic and here are the ants. And mm. here's my heart and here's the cosmic. And you're like, oh, there's like this, this breathing motion almost the way that you're doing this scope. Um, so love that. Love uh, Bill Bryson. If you're familiar with any of his stuff, mm-hmm. he no. he writes about like, usually travel he did one they made into a movie um called a walk in the woods where he does like the appalachian trail Mm -hmm. and he's just he's a quirky guy and it's (laughs) awesome like he's he tells stories about how he's gonna get like afraid that a bear's gonna eat him in his tent and drag him out because of a candy bar he does all this deep research that he like tells you how that's actually happened but then Uh he like just takes you on this journey and oh well um I found I have an eye for quirky stories. Like I particularly enjoy them. Um, My wife was in nursing school years ago and one of her colleagues um, had to put her dog down. Mm. So we went over to her house and we're bringing her some cookies and flowers and stuff. And Mm -hmm. and we're there and chatting with her and this like kind of soft music is playing. And my wife asked her like, what is this? And the gal says, well, I really felt bad that I had to leave Stanley, her bulldog that had passed away. Um, oh. we had to leave him alone all the time. So I leave this music playing and, um, we're like, that's so sweet. She's like, yeah, the CD has been playing nonstop for like five years. And internally I'm like, Whoa, that Whoa. is, Whoa. that's great. That's a lot. <laughs> and we're like, Oh, that's really touching. And she kind of like, she smiles, she feels seen. And she goes, yeah, it probably, it probably was mostly for me though. You know, since mm. Stanley was deaf. 
Oh. And I'm like, wait, wait you've second. been playing a CD for five years for your deaf bulldog to make <laughs> no. him feel better? Like, <laughs> you can't make this up. Like, you're so weird. <laughs> yeah. Like, everybody's weird. And so I love... I love stories like that. I like I'll just whip out my phone and start like making a note. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so I, I have a several lists on my phone of weird stories and <laughs> things that people say. So that is. Great. I love Bill Bill Bryson for that. That's um, awesome. That's awesome, man. Yeah. Uh, other other influencers love, obviously, um, C.S. Lewis, and mm-hmm. sometimes I. I really I, I loved East of Eden. I loved Steinbeck. Mm-hmm. That I have not loved his other things as much. Mm-hmm. Um, but the long rambling prose that is a sentence, is a paragraph, is this uh, journey where you're like, I never felt disjointed. I felt like uh, it was just this complexity. <laughs> like I, I didn't mind that the sentence was that long. I'm like, yeah. I love that stuff. Yeah. And so when well, I'm have, writing about, oh, oh, I was, go ahead. I was just gonna say, have you ever read uh, Lewis's Paralandra? Yes. Read? Okay. That's a great example. Yeah. It's like what? Yes. What? I'm gonna have to go back and reread that page because I think it was one whole sentence. <laughs> it was, you know, so. Oh, so that's actually this triggers that thing. One of my like needs for my reading is I love I love science fiction. I love mm. fantasy. Like so, yeah. I'll have on my desk they'll be like, wait, why is Stephen Hawking's A Brief History of Time then next to East of Eden, then next <laughs> to like Chesterton's Orthodoxy, and then you have like some science fiction or fantasy book like yeah. wow like mm-hmm. well those are all telling different stories and everything mm-hmm. is and i need these places that feel like rest mm-hmm. and totally total detachment like mm-hmm. oh i can just read this story and be enjoying the fact that we're going into space <laughs> right. and we're fighting aliens like <laughs> right. that's awesome <laughs> right. yeah. and then i can read something about the soul and not feel yeah. like everything is demand and asked yeah. so that's good, man. That's that's really good. I again, I bring up the kindred spirit because I I have on my dresser next to our bed. I I had about four books just stacked up. I think one of them was actually your dad's at one point, one of his most recent ones, and I had to go put that away. Yeah. I was like, no, I just I can't do any more elders right now. But I, <laughs> <laughs> no offense, John. So then, uh, so, but then, uh, you know, I have to have that moment where it's like I escape. And I'm not as just thinking about just self improvement or the you know behaviors of what I'm doing day to day and the you know because you don't want it to become that you know any any place that like the books that I've read that I mean, like Killing Lions for instance the book that you and your dad wrote mm-hmm. wonderful wisdom you know just wonderful bits and pieces of just hey this is really some good stuff for a father and son this is really good for any young man this is any this is really good for any older man who has sons who may feel disconnected even you know here's some ways mm-hmm. in to have conversations and just ingesting that all the time can really weigh on your soul and be like okay i'm never actually going to get to this i'm never going to be able to do it i'm just i have to do something else to escape from it in some sense oh, so, really? So, yeah. Oh, and we're the age of self improvement, right? Like, yeah. there's just there <laughs> yeah. is the next. Okay, here's mm-hmm. like we love Tim Ferriss around here, but Tim Ferriss is like the king of mm-hmm. how do we boil this down to its most condensed? And you're going to be like a Superman in your workouts. You're going to be oh, super effective yeah. in your office, and you're like, oh my gosh, you, <laughs> I feel so ineffective now because I'm supposed to be super effective <laughs> everywhere. I just want to go lie down on the couch. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so you totally. I yeah. need those rhythms yeah. of like I can either watch this movie Mm -hmm. or read this book and I don't have to, Mm -hmm. nothing in my life has to change afterwards. (laughs) Like that's okay. Mm -hmm. And isn't it, isn't it kind of like that is the the stereotype of the writer though? Like the, like the, the freelance writer who just, which part? Yeah. Well, the the part of like, I just do things on a whim and like I, when I feel inspired, Uh, I will, I, I will do it when, you know, the wind blows correctly and I'm outside and I'm immersed and, you know, the leaves are blowing just right. And I hear the, that's the, very romantic. You know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. so it's, it's kind of like, there's this romance of wanting to be a writer because everything just flows and there's just this, you know, unfiltered, unadulterated, anything on you. And yet mm-hmm. the reality is, is like, if you're really trying to hone the craft, if you're really trying to become a master of it, you, you have to get away from the leaves. Like you have to, you know, you, you got to get out of the whispers in the wind, man. You got to actually like, you know, build the foundation and go for it. Right. So. It becomes a lot more like exercise, and yeah. we don't like that. We like the idea of it being this inspiration. Mm-hmm. Where is my muse? I need like, I'm gonna go to it for a week into a cabin in the woods, and then mm-hmm. my novel will come. And it's like, mm-hmm. well, maybe, mm-hmm. or maybe you'll find another distraction there because mm-hmm. 
what you're really good at is finding distractions. My, yeah. I'm super guilty of that as well. Mm-hmm. And I don't like the idea of being like, okay, so if I went and if I apply the metaphor of like a deadlift, that mm-hmm. sounds terrible. Like I'm going to go hurt myself. <laughs> but, uh, but it, writing like that is that is that craft that rhythm that there mm-hmm. needs to be this that structure and mm-hmm. and part of the structure, yes, is rest. But I don't think when it comes to writing, mm-hmm. we err there. I think we err on the other side. We're very, I think I'm very good at rest. It's, I've been resting for a couple of years now. Um, okay. Yeah. I Which I think to some people sounds like what you've been resting for two years at your work. Like how is that even possible? I I, I literally got up <laughs> oh, at five yeah. this morning and I was working till nine tonight. You know, like there's sort of that not nine to five but five to nine mentality of I yeah. just got to bust my tail and the idea of rest is just not even there. It's just not even a mm. you know a second's glance. So. If you want to unpack that a little bit more, you know, feel free to. Yeah, that's super fair. So rest mm-hmm. is really contextual, right? Because mm-hmm. we do a weekly podcast. We're about to put out a print, uh, our third installment of, we now do a print version of our magazine. Mm-hmm. Um, so we've been working our tails off on that. There's new content we're running for that. I've mm-hmm. actually been doing different correspondence with readers for this letters section, mm-hmm. writing forwards and new articles. So actually, I consider all that rest because that is not work in my creative writing space Mm. and i actually say the rest there with a little bit of disappointment like i haven't Mm. been fighting for the space of going and spending that hour each morning practicing those muscles that's Mm. actually atrophying for the sake of mailing out magazines and doing this these other tasks that have taken their place Mm. um so (sighs) rest has been really good because there, there is maturity there. Mm-hmm. There is like, oh, the thing I would have said or did say last year, I wrote 80% of a book five years ago and it's sitting on Google Drive. Oh, I and know it, the like, feeling. <laughs> I know. And exactly actually, <laughs> there's part of me where it's like, that. I just need to finish it. Um, yeah. Casey Neistat has a saying that I really do appreciate, which is mm-hmm. don't let perfect get in the way of good. Mm-hmm. Don't let this thing that you want to just, you can craft it forever. Mm-hmm. But there's this, there's that book that I forget the title now, but the claim to fame is it took the author 10 years to write it. And I'm like, that's easy. Yeah. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I can, I can totally spend 10 years tinkering away on something. Mm-hmm. I have, yeah. I'm going to be able to say that about mine. What's hard is finishing and being okay with where it is yes. and being okay with like, this is a lifelong thing. And so, mm-hmm. yeah, when I, when I say I've been resting for two years, it's like, oh, there's actually a little bit of disappointment and mm-hmm. I have been focus on other things, mm-hmm. resting the the creative writing space. That's good, so. man. That's really good. Um, it made me think of two things, actually. Well, first of all, uh, are you familiar with Lewis's Great Divorce? I'm sure. Mm-hmm. Okay, like, you know, like, the scene where he's watching people, like, in hell, and they're just rebuilding things constantly? And it made me, when you said the, when you made the comment about uh, you can always recraft it, and you can always just redo the story, it made me think of that for a moment. Like, that's kind of like hell. Like if you're just mm-hmm. always re-sculpting it, you're just trying to make it that much better. Because I think as you know, it's like as time goes by, every writer changes maybe slightly, and if too much time goes by, it's almost like mm-hmm. you you run the risk of okay, now I'm ingesting something else, and the way that I'm filtering it onto you know the keyboard or on paper is going to look a little bit different, and what my right. maybe taste is might be a little bit different too. And I know that might sound frightening to some people. That, oh no! If you don't, if I don't get to that work that was four years old, I'll be, I'll, I'll go back and look at it. It'll be horrible. You it's know? tricky, right? Yeah, it it's, is. Tricky. It, it's very tricky, and so I guess it, it is. It does benefit from having a more open kind of. All right, I know I'm going to be always changing a little bit. I'm going to be learning. I'm going to be, you know, cultivating hopefully better habits and better right. disciplines than anything else. Oh, uh, I think it's super helpful to be like write a short story that's going to be two pages, and you like. You have to finish it today. Whatever you don't do, that short story is done. Mm-hmm. And just experience that like, okay, and here's how I would tell it right now. And like, mm-hmm. oh, the next day I might want to like change the color of the grass or the season. It's like, no, no, no. Mm-hmm. I think of this metaphor of like people will draw connections to other artistic things. And so you are mm-hmm. the sculptor carving this marble statue. Mm-hmm. Well, you keep tinkering away on that thing. And it's going to like, you may have it be perfect. It might be like the David. You're like Michelangelo. It's a, it's phenomenal. Yeah. But then you just chipped off his nose, and so now you have to change his whole head. His head's got to get smaller because his yeah. nose isn't there. So now the rest of his body. Oh. You can whittle that thing down into mm. nothingness with that constant tinkering. There has to be this place of it is not perfect. Mm. But that is okay, 
And now I'm going to set it there and be willing to try for perfection on the next one, knowing that that probably won't happen either. <laughs> exactly. You just gave me some great analogies, metaphors, imagery for something I would want. You know what I mean? The the sculpture incomplete, but still complete at the same time. I love it, Sam. So good stuff. So um, switching gears, going back a little bit to this idea of story, because uh, one of the things I love about your guys' podcast and uh, just Ransom Hearts when I'm kind of dipping back and forth is just this tool of storytelling and the larger narrative and how we ourselves are living in smaller narratives every single day, you know, as, as individuals, as people, like I've always, I say on my own podcast, like we're wired for storytelling. Like we're definitely wired for that. I mean, I know you guys would, would say the same, but as far as people in general thinking about the impact and the importance of good story, you know, is it important that we all either recognize that or that we are good storytellers? Like we, should we, should everyone try to be good at this? in some way, shape or form, or, you know, what are I guess, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. I mean, we were just having a conversation about this recently. Um, Mm -hmm. because I want to make space for everybody has different gifting. Like you do not need to be a phenomenal writer to tell your story. Well, Mm -hmm. like there are people that are phenomenal on stage, you hand them a microphone and they're just going to go. And that person doesn't have to be you either. If you're really good at writing on black and white if you're good at like mm-hmm. here i am on paper and, I, and this is my safe space so mm-hmm. there's like there, there's many ways this plays out but i think for the average person's experience the, the only way they might hear story is like maybe around testimonies or maybe around mm-hmm. like these big dramatic moments these shifts these like and this is how i look back now and understand everything and like that that is helpful but that's like that's a slice mm-hmm. that's a slice of storytelling Yep. Um, we believe it's really important to be able to read our own lives as a story and they are unfolding. And so looking backwards is helpful, but even looking into today and what is unfolding, what's unfolding in this season in front of me, I may not know what's coming, but there are, there are flavors, there are trajectories, there are old patterns that like, mm-hmm. if, if we don't read them, we will be blind to the way that they're going to play out. And so to that, I would encourage people to practice mm-hmm. it. Like I, you may not need to be an orator. You may not need to be a raconteur. You may not need to mm-hmm. be able to sit down and tell your story in a blog. That's okay. Mm-hmm. But I would really encourage everyone to practice uh, telling a small story of the last month, mm-hmm. telling a story, like a, give a snippet and give an attempt of like, this is where I was. This is what happened because that is going to lead into, oh, and this is how I felt. This is how I, so this is what a lot of journaling is, right? For yeah. people that are like, they get into that, they're, they're processing this whole internal story because whether we're aware of it or not, we are telling ourselves stories. Mm-hmm. The world is telling us a story. Mm-hmm. Um, the people that want to sell you stuff are phenomenal at telling stories. And so if you are the weakest storyteller in your world, the, everyone else would be happy to tell you a story for you. Hmm. And you're going to end up just playing out the stories that they're projecting. That's really good. That's really good. Do you, um, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Jeff Goins at all and his work and mm. not. He he does um, a podcast on writing. And uh, I'm not so sure if he's continuing anymore, but he has a really good episode or a podcast that he did on just how if you're not willing to kind of help your own identity, someone will give you one. Totally. Um, yeah. And it's, so I, I always thought that was really good coming from the perspective of, well, if I'm not at least doing a little bit of self introspection here and taking some inventory from time to time, it's very easy to be caught up in, I believe this, or I believe that just because it's been told to me so many times. And mm-hmm. now it's just been ingrained in me and I'm maybe just living it out because that's all I know, you know, and I've totally, never, and I've never taken the, the, uh, maybe the initiative to even challenge it. <sighs> it's so. so good. I mean, this is a huge part of what goes on in the counseling office for people to have experienced that, mm-hmm. that that's going to sound very familiar of like, oh yeah, like the, the words that got spoken, the story that then played out, that's certainly true of my story. I talk about that a little bit in Killing Lions, mm-hmm. but for people that haven't been in that context, they're like, that is, that's a huge piece of unpacking your life. Be like, yeah. why do you, maybe you self-describe as being an introvert. Like, mm-hmm. was that something that was said over you when you were five and- <laughs> 
then you just sort of said, oh yeah, I guess I am. And you kept living that way, but you're really lonely and you want to be with people more. Like <laughs> if you're not, if you're not aware of the story being told over you, you're going to be living under it and be really struggling against it. And you're like, wait, why do I, why am I lonely? And I feel like my personality is different. There's just, there's so many ways this plays out. And so, yes, totally. I come back to <laughs> It, you don't have to do it perfectly. You don't have to be the most dramatic, like, and then this happened. You don't even have to know yep. where the crisis is. You can just begin with what you think is mm-hmm. a very normal day. Mm-hmm. There are no normal days. All and right. so that's you right. can start there, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to end up being very helpful. That's, that's good, man. That's really good. So as far as where you guys are going in the future here with Ann's sons and, you know, just where, you know, Sam Eldridge is going and what he's doing, what is potentially on the horizon? Because I know that, I mean, this book, Killing Lions, dealt a lot with just masculinity, you know, and the rites of passage of it. I mean, is that going to be forward moving for you guys? Like, this is what you're hoping to work on in the future? I mean, we kind of touched on this, but not really. But are you looking to write something in, like, science fiction? Because, like, that's what I do is, like, I, I love science fiction. So, so I, I'm writing the sequel to my first self-published book that's now four years old, and I'm literally at 95% done. And I'm just going, I just got to get over this hurdle, stop tinkering with it, you know, just get it done. And I love science fiction. I just love it. So, but I also love this kind of stuff, you know, with like killing lions and, you know, just, you know, just good stuff for the soul. And I could see myself also writing in that voice and wanting to speak into those places as well. So is that also something you have been kind of tinkering with and maybe praying about, thinking about like, you know, like where, where am I going to go in the next couple of years? Yeah, totally. So Anne Sons, I think is meant to be as focused as possible. So mm-hmm. we really have been distilling down this idea of like masculinity in today's climate in, and really that premise of like, who I'm going to, uh, who am I going to be in 10, 20, 30 years? And, and mm-hmm. what do I do and see about my life now that's going to help that? Mm-hmm. And so into that, we throw beauty and adventure and all of the nuances of how that plays out because we actually don't believe that our lives need to be like dressed up to be interesting. We believe that God meets us in all those places and all of those desires are super valid. Your desire to go kiteboarding, you can meet God there as much as your desire to teach in the inner city. And you can actually be a person that does both. Like the world is infinitely complex and yeah. it's, we bless that. And we also try to walk that out and show examples of how that gets done. So Hmm. like that's what our nine to five Monday to Friday job is. That's what Mm -hmm. we do on a podcast is all the ways that that plays out. That's what we do with the print. Um, We love working with films. So we Mm -hmm. did a motorcycle film a while ago and we doing small snippets. Like we just, Mm. we kind of get to be creative. It's awesome. (laughs) I get, I get paid to do personally to answer the question. Mm -hmm. Um, I've never been like a list maker, like when mm-hmm. I get my bucket list for the next five years. My wife is like that. And so she's like kind of forced me to do it on occasion. And it's been super helpful. <laughs> um, and on my, I just made a new, a new one. And on the next five years, I have both. I have hmm. write a solo fiction and hmm. a solo nonfiction book. Nice. Um, I think, I think like the ability to tell stories and to offer insight into man and the heart of the mm. world and the heart of people it's going to happen in both genres i think mm. one like the nonfiction is a little bit more heavy hitting and that and then you end up telling stories to provide breathing room yeah. whereas the fiction side you tell the story and through it you reveal mm-hmm. what people are like and what you think about the world and so um i think you can do both well and i've seen that done all the time so mm-hmm. I, that's that's where I'm at these days. And, um, dreaming about those, dreaming what they would be. Um, and <laughs> like I said, I've got 80% of a nonfiction written that I now would uh, would totally start carving in that marble and break off pieces and try to glue it somewhere else. I don't I yep. really know what that one. Hmm. That one I kind of ask myself the question of like, that one feels more in the professional Anson's type mm-hmm. channel. Um mm-hmm. And it's a little bit of like, if this was my last year doing this, what would I wish I had done? What would mm. I wish that I hadn't left unfinished? It's like, oh, well, I'd want to condense a lot of what we are up to because there's so much now. And be like, here mm. is 
the resource for that. And now I can walk away and into the next thing feeling good. So that's kind of more what I see that being. Mm. Um, the fiction thing, I've got two younger brothers and we all like love fantasy and sci-fi and <laughs> Miyazaki films. And, uh-huh. and we'll be like, you guys don't watch the latest Star Wars teaser that just got put out because they should have saved this for the movie. <laughs> you know, like, all, like it's just kind of constantly going on. Um, so I'd love to write something that a younger version of them Mm-hmm. would have been stoked to like oh, that's awesome. have over the summer. Yeah. That, that's my like my vision. I, I don't know what the story is yet, but I know like that's the the audience I have in mind. And it's that's like just brings joy. That's awesome. So. That's awesome. Did you see that Dune is getting a, a new movie? I don't know if you're familiar with Dune at all. Oh if super you... familiar with Dune. <sighs> oh <that's good. laughs> I I have not seen the old movie. Okay. Uh, the book. I when I counter the book, I mm-hmm. like had that moment where you sit down on the couch and you're like how did no one show me this? I know. How did I find this sooner? Like, this is amazing. I'm not going anywhere. So I had no idea they're making a new movie. And yeah. I'm a little worried. The guy, yeah, the guy, I know. It's always like when you hear they're doing some kind of like franchise, potential franchise in Hollywood, you're just going, oh, please, please find someone that will do it justice. Please don't do something ridiculous and off the off the deep end and have all these other agendas and everything yeah. else. So um, the guy who is directing it, from what I understand, is the same person who did Blade Runner 2049. I think it's oh. uh, uh, Dennis. I don't even know. I can't pronounce his last name, so I'm, I'm going to botch it. So I will not say okay. who it is. But the the director for it, I believe he's the lead director on it. And I, I I was I was very much tickled pink when I heard about that, Sam. I was like, yes, thank that's you. Cool. <laughs> I think that'll yeah, be the, I mean, the right guy. That's an aside. But like, how many people have made sequels that – people have been generally happy with like blade runner oh. was kind of an interesting yeah. like i everybody was stoked about it uh, uh, i mean it's it great took 30 plus years for it to get out i mean and it's kind of it's kind of interesting with sequels i mean not to get on a total tangent here i'm pretty sure we could probably take this off into the sunset but <laughs> but like <laughs> let's go i'm ready ready <laughs> but like for instance like i was a huge fan of jurassic park when it came out mm-hmm. back in the 90s and um I remember seeing it on the big screen. I was, I probably was too young to be in the theater, but I was there because I love dinosaurs. And my dad was just like, you're going. <laughs> so, so, awesome. so I, I loved it and it was just so good. And then it's like every movie since then, uh, Jurassic World was pretty good, but it felt like a rewrite of the original. And I, yeah. I, I, fe- and I just felt like every movie since then was just like, whoa, like what did you do with the sequel? I'm just not feeling it, man. I mean, I love the dinosaurs. I love all the other stuff, but... It's very hard, I, I felt, for that franchise to get off its whatever it was on after the initial came out. And it was just like, no, you have giant dinosaurs and you have people running and screaming. This should be easy. This should be easy to pull this off and make this make this a return venture. I know. <laughs> so, I know. But it's a... the thing with, like, you're writing the sequel, right? Mm-hmm. And yep. so to your book, mm-hmm. and you know that there's that tension of if people enjoyed the first one, their request is do it again, but do it different mm. but not so different that it doesn't line up perfectly i want it to be seamless but i want it to feel fresh mm-hmm. but i want it to be better and you're like oh okay <laughs> uh, let me just uh, real quick. Mm. i mean it was like it's what jj abrams yeah. heard after he made the force awakens it was mm. it was like exactly the same as a new hope <laughs> yep and so it was too similar but everybody loved it mm-hmm. but it was too similar and then Ryan Johnson made the next one. It was too different, but yeah. the critics loved it. And you're just like, and the, oh, you guys. And the fans are going, I wonder what the third one's going to look like. Like, I have no oh, idea. Oh, gosh. You know, is there... just go... <sighs> <laughs> Do you, what is your, what is your prediction? Do you think Ray's going to be a Sith? Do you think Ray will end up being a Sith in this one? I, I, I mean, if, oh, I don't mm-hmm. know. You don't know. Did you see the latest, the D23, whatever, yeah. Disney's little expos going on? So you saw their... Yeah, I did their, see the teaser. The, the right. Sith yeah. Army knife, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, that... I don't know. Don't I don't know. know. Because if it was Ryan Johnson again, I'd be like, well, there's not going to be a Jedi or Sith, but now mm-hmm. it's Abrams, and he mm-hmm. actually likes the dichotomy. So yeah. uh, that'd be really interesting. Mm-hmm. I think no. I think no. at the end of the day... Disney would really love to sell some Ray action figures and they're going to say, you can't turn her into a bad guy. <laughs> she may go bad and then need redemption. Like, so I, I, I like the fact that you're not seeing that with the idealist lens. You're seeing it through the realist lens on that one. <laughs> you're kind of like, yeah, there's yeah, big, 
<laughs> It'd be cool. Yeah, it could be. But then we would need her redemption, right? Because that's everybody. We like those arcs. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. And yes, there's a little bit of like the the realist who's like, at the end of the day, they want to sell toys at Christmas. <laughs> <Exactly>. So <laughs> awesome. now they get to sell one with her holding a red lightsaber and her. Sell it. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's. It's it's all convoluted now, man. It's all going to come together. You know, it's going to make billions. Probably, it's it's going to be it's going to be big. It's going to be big. Fourteen year old me is disappointed at how jaded current me sounds. I'll yeah. just say that. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Trust me, I have I have five brothers, Sam, and we have very sort of open dialogue, and it goes every which way about the new Star Wars trilogy. So it's <laughs> it's a it's a pretty pretty similar dynamic. In fact, there's probably one brother who's totally who's a lot younger than me. Um, who is a little bit removed from the Star Wars thing, and he is just like, "Oh, really? They're making those?" And we're just like, "Okay, you're not allowed to talk anymore. You're just you're out. <laughs> <laughs> you're done. You're not." You're... And you've been muted in this conversation. <laughs> exactly. Just go back to doing whatever you're doing. We don't even know anymore. So just uh, go over there. So so sad. excellent, excellent man, excellent. Uh, this has been a great pleasure of mine uh, to get to talk to you. As I'm gonna pull this in for a landing here, Sam. I know your time is uh, valuable. So. Um, Really enjoy this conversation, talking about uh, just the writing process and just what you guys are up to. I love the ministry. I love what you guys do over at Ransom Heart, at Ann Sons. Um, you know, Thanks, I'm uh, listening up to the podcast whenever I get a free minute. I got three kids, all under the age of four, so I don't I don't get tons of free. This is pretty rare for me right now, so it's pretty cool. To get, yeah. a little, get a little bit of time. Well, thanks for inv- and having me in on your free time, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, I mean, I didn't mean to steal sure. the stage. Yes, this was <laughs> this is definitely. Oh no, no. <laughs> Josh, this has been this has been super easy, super enjoyable. Cool, man. So. Awesome. So, where can we go to find more about you? We mentioned a lot of the stuff that you're doing, and Sons and the Ransom mm-hmm. Heart Group. Where can we go to find where you're up to, or you know, social media handles, all that good stuff? Yeah, yeah. So um, we're both. And Sons and And Sons Magazine. If you end up typing in the full thing, um, mm-hmm. you'll end up finding us. Um, we're everywhere podcasts are hosted. We're on Spotify, we're on iTunes, we're on mm-hmm. Stitcher, all that good stuff. Um, but I would totally send you to AnSonsMagazine.com. We've got mm-hmm. kind of a cool uh, trailer there for the print, and that's where you can find access to those things, as well as the archive. We did an online magazine for mm-hmm. seven years, so there's just all this content on there for free. Um, and then if folks want to we do a subscription. Um, it's like 10 bucks a copy for these things, which is killer considering mm. how much it costs to make and the quality. Like we're, we're giving these things away. So <laughs> it's, it's awesome to be in a place where we get to do that. But yeah, and sons and sons magazine.com. Awesome. Awesome. Sam, we'll keep up the good work, man. Continue to rest when you can. Um, do you have a, you have a little one now, correct? Yeah, or, we got two. So uh, we have yeah. two, uh, we have one year old and a two year old. Awesome. Awesome. So your hands are full as well. So I totally, yeah. I totally, yeah. And to think of it, just right with you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So three was kind of, I think three's our breaking point. So if you're thinking of doing the trifecta, uh, mm-hmm. kind of like your own parents did, I mean, just that probably will be the breaking point, I think. So, <laughs> so <we'll see. sighs> I don't know. I don't know if you guys are know. thinking, I don't know if you're thinking that long term yet, but what do you have? Oh no, we're, we're hoping for four, but uh, mm-hmm. right now two feels like plenty. So we're going to give it a little <laughs> bit of breathing room. Right, right. I see. I see why people decide to stop. I would just say plenty of mercy there. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> well, good for you guys, man. Good for you. So, all right, Sam, thanks again, man. Check them out at Ann Sons Magazine. Uh, Sam Eldridge, thanks again for being on the Writer's Lens. Thanks, Josh.